Okay, hello, and welcome to this eCampus News webinar, How to Build Efficiencies and Securities in Higher Ed Through Forms Process Automation. My name is Kevin Hogan. I'm the Editor-at-Large for eCampus, and I'm excited to have you join us for what should be a very informative session. Today's event is brought to you by Adobe Sign. Adobe Sign helps schools go paperless, which revolutionizes the business of running an institution. Use Adobe Sign to create seamless workflows that are simple for staff and students to complete and can save your school both time and money. Reduce errors, increase security and compliance, and foster operational resiliency. From HR, finance, and procurement forms to student-facing forms, paperless workflows powered by Adobe Sign can create digital experiences in schools that make life a little easier for the entire campus community. Before we go to our conversation, I'd like to take a minute to go over some features of the platform that we're using for this webinar. Today's event will be recorded, so you don't have to worry about missing a thing. Within a few days, you'll receive an email message that contains a link to the recorded webinar, along with a PDF of the slides. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation by clicking on the Q&A box. There will be a time at the end of the presentation for our speakers to address questions but if you have them during the conversation, I highly encourage you just put them in there and we'll, we'll enter them into the conversation. We're all pretty adept at Zoom at this point, so we don't necessarily have to wait for a formal Q&A. Also, uh, if you have a question for a speaker, use that Q&A box, but if you have a, a technical question, use the chat box if you're having a problem and someone from the eSchool News team will reach out to you there. So with those housekeeping items out of the way, let's get started. Uh, with me today, a great panel uh, of, of guests here who have great insights into the workings of higher ed and forms process automation. We'll start off with uh, Dr. Steve Ball. Steve uh, is a faculty member at Winona State University, where he teaches in the Leadership Education Department and directs the doctoral program in education. Prior to joining w uh, WSU, Steve spent 30 years in K-12 school systems in Illinois, Indiana, and Iowa, and teaching for the University of Wisconsin. For the, for the 13 years prior to moving to the university level, he also served as a public school superintendent. He has written 10 books on a variety of educational and historic topics. He holds doctorates in instructional technology and ed education leadership and policy studies. Also with us today, Rico Demore. Rico is uh, the Director of Academic Services Technology at Benedictine University. This, the school is a private university with the main campus in Lyle, Illinois, and another campus in Mesa, Arizona. Uh, the school offers coursework in uh, Dalian, China, as well as Vietnam. RICO provides the primary administrative management and support for the, for the university's online learning environment, which is called Desire to Learn. His responsibilities include supporting the faculty, students, instructional designers, and other community members to build and maintain online learning opportunities in desire to learn for the university's international student population. And I think that will certainly uh, get some interesting insights there on taking forms processing to the global level. Last but not least, Chitra um, Mitha. She is the Director of Edu Institutions Marketing with Adobe. Chitra has over 20 years of strategic product marketing experience in the technology industry. She has held various leadership roles at Adobe including product marketing for Adobe Photoshop, Creative Cloud, Adobe Acrobat, and Adobe Sign. She has expertise in using data analysis, customer insights, and in-depth understanding of geographic nuances to develop global customer growth and retention strategies. She currently leads the education institutions business at Adobe with responsibility across creative and document cloud products. She is also a CPCC Coactive Coach and an ICF certified AACC executive coach and mentor. So uh, as you can see, we have a lot of experience uh, and also uh, a lot of insights that I'm really looking forward to. Welcome everybody and thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to join me today. Uh, let's, let's get started uh, and talk a little bit about what we really don't want, at least I'll speak for myself, I don't wanna talk about it anymore, but uh, you know, the pandemic, and, and COVID-19 and what that has meant for this completely 
disruptive thing that has happened uh, at the university level from not only the classroom side of things, but also the back office side of things. I mean, March 2020 was when my one college co-ed came home and never to return uh, with her laptop. And all of a sudden, uh, you know, her bedroom became her classroom. Uh, the year after that, uh, she was back in a hybrid setup. But I know that all of your institutions had to deal with that sort of situation. Um, and let's talk a little bit about where your schools were BP before the pandemic, when it came to the automations of forms processing, and where you are now, almost two years after all the madness began. And maybe Steve, we'd start with you a little bit. Sure. I think you know, at least with Winona State within our College of Education, you know, we're all housed within the same three buildings, right? About sixty faculty, and so it was pretty easy to just walk down the hall and get something done. And you know, now. I have a colleague who's living in Atlanta, Georgia. I have a colleague who's in Nevada. And you can't kind of do things in that same way. And it's, that's difficult for our office staff sometimes because they want to just be able to do that. But we had not really automated many, if any, of our forms, particularly at the graduate level. Uh, there was a definite attempt to work with, you know, the larger body of undergraduate students and automate forms. But that necessarily didn't transfer to all programs. You know, it was more sort of general ed requirements at the undergraduate level and other programs just, you know, if they wanted to come on board, they could, but there wasn't necessarily a, a direct requirement or even a push administratively to say, hey, we need to do that. And then when we're all spread out, now it's much more difficult. And so we have to do a better job of, you know, moving, students work around and, you know, getting things signed off of uh, one of the ladies who I work with yesterday actually was a little frustrated because somebody had gotten one of the forms to sign electronically. Well, she printed it out, signed it, and then was struggling to get it scanned back, you know, to Karen. And so those are the kind of things that it, it takes time and we have to really move slowly and you know speaking with one of my deans as I prepped for this you know she was really talking about the things that have worked well or things that she already had in planning that she could just roll out where the processes had already been outlined one of the things that's become difficult is when you can't just walk down the hall and say hey how do you do this mm. right or who does it have to go to you know there's that whole knowledge management piece that you have to address that we haven't necessarily done effectively because we never needed to Mm -hmm. right? You don't have to write stuff down. You can live in an oral tradition environment if everybody's right down the hall. Right. Yeah. So now that that's not the case, you know, things are having to change a little bit more. Right. Enrico, how about for you? To give us give us that transformation over the past uh, 20 months or so. And you're muted. Enrico, you're, okay, you are. One. Uh, it has to happen in every webinar. It has to happen. Right. So, and yeah, I'm that yeah. guy. Um, but anyways, um, yeah, no, well, it started before the pandemic, pre-pandemic, if you want to call it. Um, one of the things we moved to automate was the uh, new, new employee exiting employee stuff. Mm. Because there was a number of things that had to be signed off on the IT side, on the academic technology side. And that, so that worked very well prior to and came in very handy when we went to, you know, into pandemic mode because people were still leaving and coming, being hired and, you know, being fired. So, so that was, that was pretty well. Everybody was from their, you know, their home office. Right. And, and it just worked well. But then after that first couple of months, it became increasingly evident that it might stay like this for a while, you know, and then decisions were made to, close the campus for the summer and that meant people not working out of their offices so you know then some of the the ground swell of things to, to Steve's point and your point Kevin how do we get things done with people not being in the same place right you know so one of those things I saw on the innovation side is everything that goes through you know budgeting and sale or anything that we purchase through the provost office you know, they used to just keep it in a big file and a filing cabinet somewhere. Now it's electronic. 
we have to submit a PDF to everybody uh, for everything we buy and all the pieces and emails that go along with it. So they want an electronic record that they could, you know, um, just file away electronically because let's be honest, you know, Manila folders take up space when you start stacking them up and storing them. So that was something too. Um, the, uh, the enrollment process for students was pretty electronic up until that point, but I think it required some signatures too as well. So I think they did a lot of, um, a lot of work with a signing, you know, program that allowed for electronic signing. Um, so, you know, yeah, that the pandemic force of, well, frankly, we were 50% non-traditional before the pandemic. So a lot of those processes that were in the university already were still were kind of already adapted to electronic, but that still remains the other 50% of the university had to adjust and pivot. And, you know, we had to get, uh, they started using a lot more electronic signatures for signing off on textbook adoptions and some of the other things we're talking about though. So, you know, from, from my perspective, obviously it, it, it kind of like Steve was mentioning it, it pushed people into, all right, we have to figure out how we could do it now. You know, and you, and you mentioned internationally throw in a, uh, you know, a, a program in mainland China where people can't travel to mainland China anymore. Right. And, you know, when we get sent a FedEx every time we need something signed, same thing with Vietnam. So, you know, and a couple of time zones away in Mesa. So I think there's a lot of recognition of more and more things have to become automated like that. Mm -hmm. Electronic signature has to be OK. But, you know, like I'm sure a lot of institutions, sometimes it's it's very slow moving. But I think the pandemic definitely forced the necessity of some of it. And now, Chitra, you know, from from your experience and um, watching the use of your products and technologies um, accelerate over the years. I mean, the, the, as Rico mentioned, the PDF is pretty much the uh, the standard bearer when it comes to electronic documents. Um, I'm assuming that you saw some spikes in, in usage starting in March of 2020. Talk a little bit about um, this acceleration from from your perspective. So it's, it's both the things that um, Steve and Rico talked about, right? Um, it's, it's different organizations were sort of in different stages of their journey. And when I think about um, sort of education, I, I break it down into three areas of way in which the forms or uh, processes work, right? There's one that's student facing or student related. There is uh, the staff management or um, HR, sort of personnel management side of things. And then there's all of this administrative areas that Rico called out, you know, the budget, the vendor management, the procurement, you know, all of the things that are administrative in nature. And each of these things were slightly in different stages of their uh, journey of digital transformation. And PDF or Acrobat always kind of played a really important role and it was available in in many areas. But um, interestingly, you know, signatures were not necessarily as widely um, accepted or available as um, Steve called out, you know, you, when, when you can just literally walk over or when a student can come into the, you know, the, the office of the registrar to get some paperwork done, there was really no need to do um, what now we're all sort of forced to do it. So um, from a usage standpoint, yeah, the, the demand and the opportunity and the usage definitely did go up, but especially higher ed has always been on this journey and um, there's different phases. So as, as Steve called out, like there's, if undergrad was the big opportunity and there were many, many students in undergrad, then they probably moved those processes faster down the path of digitization. And if uh, you know postdoctoral students or doctoral students were not as many in number, then they were like, oh, let's just keep these processes in sort of the older way. But what happened, I think, with the pandemic is everybody sort of were forced to kind of move into that digital experience of working with, uh, with processes. And it's interesting to hear both Rico and Steve because when I when I hear um, most of the customer challenges, it's process, 
and it's it's change management, right? Um, oh, but how do I do it? La, last I remember, I would just stand over my desk and I could look over to my neighbor and I would ask them how to do it versus now um, there's this resistance and there's this fear of how do I handle this? I don't know what's going on. And what we are learning as a as an organization is it's not just enough to sell a, a solution or develop a technology to answer the challenges, but to help people um, through the change management, help people um, figure out the process aspect of it and kind of guide them through that. It, it's as critical as delivering a technology solution to this. Yeah, the, the, go ahead, Steve. I was gonna just say what Chitra just said about, you know, the technology is the easy piece. Right. I mean, those other pieces are so important that, you know, we talked about that prior planning. OK, what am I going to do? And then notifying people how it's going to be done, that training, that testing. Right. It's in some of those things have kind of been in place. You know, Chitra will talk about, you know, sort of those administrative pieces, the finance. They've been moving along, I think, in most places just because they've had to. But then when you have ch changes, right, for instance, if you have a new department chair who comes in, who is on the faculty, that onboarding process doesn't necessarily cover those things and they can't just walk down the hall now. So they've got to be able to use the, you know, the help tools that are online, which are sometimes helpful, sometimes not so much help, you know, almost like the Dobert no help desk, if you remember that. <laughs> I have flashbacks to that every once in a while in totally. looking for, okay, how do I do this? And so... You know, that, that's so important, I think, in that training part is, is really, you know, essential. And, and even if you could do it digitally, people didn't want to necessarily. I think we mentioned when we were, you know, prepping for this, three years ago, I worked for a different institution, and you still had to sign your grade sheet, even if they were all in the learning management system, and submit them. They still wanted a hard copy. I think the pandemic has finally gotten those thoughts out of the system because they just can't do it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're still, you know, moving, moving forward even little bit by little bit, you're still starting to see where is that shift? You know, there's a push now to kind of go back. And then actually one of my students told me Tuesday night that their department at a different university than I work at is gonna go all online in the spring because they're worried, they'd rather prepare for it hmm. than have to, you know, pivot all of a sudden, February 3rd, when they say, hey, we have to, you know, quarantine again. So mm -hmm. that preparation is just so important. And the more we can kind of tell people ahead of time and provide real training for people and make sure the systems work, right? We had somebody sent out a, a link to a video that was supposed to explain something. And of course, the video was blocked because it came through Grenada. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's just that real need to make sure our training is really effective too yeah. and help. And, and for me, when I think of documents, right, especially when we think of forms and paperwork and things like that, uh, the, the nice thing, at least for, for us, from a technology standpoint, you know, Adobe, as Rico said, PDFs have been pretty much the way people would communicate. And, and it was interesting, like literally the example Rico gave was, uh, you know, what we were thinking about, like these budget sheets that are, you know, on, on files, and then there's suddenly cabinets and cabinets of paperwork and, and truckloads of paperwork that kind of go back and forth. Uh, and you don't need to do that anymore. And you just can convert it into a PDF. And the, the thing where it sort of broke down was, yeah, they would email a PDF, but when it comes to signatures, people would still print that PDF sign it and then now they have to figure out like you said the way to scan it and then send it back and you're still now spending money on ink on paper uh you are not send, spending it but you're sending it to somebody who is then still spending it on paper so the whole idea of like moving from paper to digital was not sort of 100 percent. it was paper to digital to paper to back to digital <laughs> um and it was kind of funny and i think when we bring in the notion of e-signatures or the process and workflow into the conversation, you can actually truly stay in that realm of digital and you can get a lot of things done. And, and I love the comment somebody made on the chat just now on 
really thinking about like who actually needs to even sign it, right? Uh, and and it forces us to rethink it. Well, and that's I, I, you know Sharon's point there was excellent, Chitra. That you, you pointed out that you know I was never a person who had a stamp with my signature. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, now I'm in a leadership role again, and they're like, well, we can get a stamp. I'm like, well, if I'm supposed to sign it, shouldn't I read it? <laughs> and we have so many people who are signing so many things that they never read, right? Or they're not even signing, their, their assistant's doing it with a stamp. And so I think we also have the opportunity to really scale back how many things people go through people's hands, especially if they can go in and digitally see it, right? So I, I think it's important not so much important just to be able to sign it digitally in that flow. The next step is really, and maybe this weekend you can put together a new product that helps us actually, you know, do the knowledge management piece of where that data goes. Because I think that's the next struggle is people start to realize, all right, we can do this digitally and this makes sense. The question is, okay, where do we store it? Yeah. Right. Are we storing it in one faculty member spot? You know, their OneDrive? Are we putting it in Teams? Are we putting it in SharePoint? Are we putting it somewhere else? Or are we putting a little bit of in all those places and making a bigger mess than Rico's file cabinet? Because at least you could go to that one file cabinet to find it eventually. Right? Well, and so, go ahead. No, and to Steve's point, right, there's a lot of like, quote, engineering on premise to that, right? Right? We could solve the immediate problem of we need this paper signed, we need it electronically signed. But to Steve's point, there's three or four steps after it. There's a few before it. If we plan it right, you know, one might think, you know, no one puts in any time into it, but naming convention has a lot to do with too. Because again, if you're Steve, you know what the file is, but maybe, you know, Tom, who needs to work with the electronic file, doesn't. So getting that university wide like direction as to you know what the process is what we're trying to fix what do we do with it like you said store it can we call it back how long do we retain it all these pieces that are are way past just hey we're going to make it a pdf and let people electronically sign it right and and see yeah. i think i think hands are being forced because i don't know if this is a regional thing but there's a paper shortage in illinois mm -hmm. right where i'm at so so you know Principals are talking to teachers about, you know, digitizing their content because they can't get the paper or the paper is twice what it was and stuff like that. So, again, I think more and more people through the pandemic, especially at schools, universities, et cetera, are starting to see that there is stuff they can do electronically that they don't have to do on paper. But to Steve's point, then that causes, you know, the, the next layer of what's happening. You know, I see it with my own mother who's 70 some odd years old, she'll kill me for saying it, but she just went to electronic payment of her insurance and electronic documents. And that's hard for her because she can't print it out, put it in your filing camera, which she's got the last 50 years. But I think through the pandemic, not being able to get that, you know, not being able to get, she's like, okay, I can do this. You know, I think, and I think more and more of our instructors, professors, staff workers are seeing this like, okay, we saw a different way we could do this. It could work and it will work. But then again, we let the, the, the second piece of that is, okay, now we digitize it, what happens to it? Well, Enrico, you make a good point with just the naming conventions, simple things like that. Where is it? How does it file? You know, how do you add the date to it in such a way that we know which is the newest version? Because like with students with a program and studies mm -hmm. document, for instance, how often might that change in somebody's three or four years of, of graduate school? And then, you know, not me, their advisor, but an office worker or somebody in the graduate school office who wants to go make sure that they completed everything in order to graduate, where do they find that, right? Yeah. Because they're not in the student information system because those are documents that are for the most part handled by advisors and there are a lot of them. So the people who run the student information system don't necessarily want us all in there messing around with things, which I understand at a bunch of different levels, you know, but how do we do that? And how do we not put a lot of periods in that name? Because, you know, the English teacher wants to put six periods and I'll, you know, I'll write back and be like, you know, this is good until somebody has to recover that file. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and how yeah, underscores are cleaner in the naming, all that. You yeah. know, I can't tell you the number of professors, I, I won't name them, but I can't tell you the number of professors that 
We're working with them. Well, what's your syllabus called? Um, first initial, last name, syllabus. Is that from this past fall, spring? No, it's, that's my syllabus. And they just keep changing. You know what I mean? So to Steve's point, it'd be nice if this was the fall you know, 2021 syllabus. And I'm going to bring in the, you know, the fall 2020. So, you know, so yeah, naming convention and like where to, you know, how to call it so other people can recall it, even your own self, I think is. And recall and find the right one so that 10 right. years from now, when I have to go pull a syllabus for a student because they want to get their teaching license in Iowa and I have to send them the syllabus from the right time, I can go get the right one. Yeah, yeah right. and I think both of you are bringing up what we've been, uh, you know, uh, what I mentioned earlier, which is that idea that, you know, technology is the easy part in, in some sense. Uh, it's the people and the process, right? And, and, and this is where um, the IT departments or the tech departments or the system administrators, not sure like who in each university might be different, um, have to really take that sort of leadership or that be that champion for that standardization, for guiding the process, for really supporting that transition. And when we think of any digital document, right? So it's a, it always probably starts as a Word, a spreadsheet or a PDF I mean, or a PowerPoint, what have you. But then it gets converted into a PDF and at some point it needs to be stored. And I think Steve, you're bringing up archival and retrieval as you know, key components of the, the digital uh, document journey. And that's how we think about it is you know, from the creation of the document all the way through to archival and retrieval, what are the sort of steps that we need to do? And it's increasingly clear that you know, people have a huge role to play. Technology can only go so far. And then it's how it gets implemented, how it gets rolled out is very personal and very specific and individual to each university or institution. And that kind of pretty much dictates to your point, the success or the not so success of um, a particular technology. And, you know, yeah, you can show, show, um, store everything in a SharePoint drive or in, in Teams or in Dropbox or or what have you, but if those connections are not there, if the file hierarchy is not sort of set up in the right way, you, you won't be able to get to the end stage of retrieval and, and um, you know, storage in the right way. So totally, totally agree and understand um, and support uh, uh, the, this, this notion of the digital document journey. And this uh, leads to uh, a question that I have to where, expand this to the other systems that you have in place in your institutions, your e-commerce platform, for instance, or other, uh, you know, grading or assessment uh, platforms, for instance. Talk a little bit about <clears throat> how you can integrate these forms that I assume each of those processes would have into those, into those other processes. I mean, I, I assume that's a pretty uh, sophisticated uh, implementation. Rika, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Well, ours, our, uh, our student uh, LMS, excuse me, learning management system has direct integrations with, with PeopleSoft, right? So obviously anything that comes out of PeopleSoft that gets signed off on there, uh, instructor of record, you know, student class list, these all, these all shoot over electronically, magically in the next couple of days, a couple of times a day. So that's usually pretty pretty active and pretty spun up. A lot of the legwork with the documents and the electronics and enrollments, that, that's all handled by the registrars, kind of entered into PeopleSoft. So I don't really have a lot of eyes or see that. I just see the end product. Um, so, but I do know like, um, I do know on our uh, procurement side, you know, if I wanna buy a piece of software, I gotta do a renewal for you know, any product we have or whatever, that goes to an electronic form. You got to fill out all the information and put previous contracts in. You got to load up the PDFs. And so the process, that process is all electronic. It was pre-pandemic too as well. Um, but, you know, obviously now that's become more and more important because, you know, again, I can't walk in a, a request you know, form to the, uh, to the face. So, you know, from that perspective, um, I think, you know, that's, that's kind of the stuff I see like on the electronic document side. Um, but, you know, Steve may have a little more to add to that, but that's, that's you know, we're, we're from where I sit, I guess. 
I think that's the, the biggest difficulty. And I, interesting, a couple of my students last night were saying, well, why don't all these systems interact and integrate? And I was like, well, you know, and they're like, well, why can't somebody build a new one that does? And then I said, well, yeah, you could go to this particular format. You know, they built out, they figured out what the 27 different systems were that most, you know, institutions used and they built it out, but nobody's moved to it yet because it would be just such a huge heavy lift to get there, right? So that's one of those things of how do you integrate those systems? And so, right, I have my class list in the learning management system, but then they're not necessarily where I would expect them to be in, you know, OneDrive or SharePoint and how do all those things get tied together? And that's back to the whole, you know, it's not the technology piece, but it's all of the planning for how that information gets used effectively, which I think is, is the real key to moving forward. Mm. I think, I think, and to, like to the points earlier, everyone's got a junk drawer in their house somewhere. And I think every university, higher education has this junk drawer where we don't know where else to put it. So we're just going to put it in the blank drive or whatever you call it at, at, you know, your thing. And I think that's part of it. Like you said, it's, you know, we're digging through, you know, we have a drive at Benedict mm -hmm. that is, we quote, someone's got to get a handle on it. I've heard it a million times in a meeting and stuff like that. And, and it's a lot of the electronic documents that they just didn't have anywhere else to put. So they just dumped it in their drive. Well, or in, in a large institution where different administrators have responsibility for different pieces of the process, right? So for instance, when we get master's students, they come to me one way in embarrassingly, I'm going to say this and be recorded. I don't even go in and check for those files until my administrative assistant goes, Hey, you know, you got like four in there. Can you go look at them for me? Because they require me signing in in a different way and there's no alert, right? There's no notification for me that there's something there. And because it's, you know, a double secure kind of sign on process that basically guts all my non secure tools, I only do it if I have to. Right. And so those are the kind of things that, okay, how do we put the notifications in place, even if we can't tie the systems together immediately to make sure at least there's some notification of this is how the process is working? Because that would be more helpful than the emails that get sent going, hey, could you go check and make sure everything's there now? Right. 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 And obviously there's a security element to it, but at the same time, you can't build a, a system that's so secure that it's no longer functional, right? Mm -hmm. There's that balance that has to be struck. And I think, especially because of COVID, and we were also worried people are going to work remotely for the first time and gosh knows what they'll do at home and what they'll bring in, that we've probably gone a little too far on the let's be secure. Doesn't, doesn't really help when they close a pipeline or two on us. But, you know, there's, there's a balance there and you got to figure out what's working, right? Sure. It's got to be a light switch for me. I just have to be able to turn it on. My light goes on and everything's there. It can't yeah. require 14 steps for me. Now, Chitra, is, are, are this resonating with you from, from the industry side in terms of the concerns that administrators have at the higher ed? And, and talk a little bit about how you address those. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it, it, it's the balance between trusting what they're signing is legal and, and uh, approved and acceptable to the point where um, it could potentially be, you know, too complicated or too difficult, right? Um, and then there's, you know, I look at it from two point of view. One is the point of view of the person who's actually setting up the systems and setting it up in a way that's usable. And then from the point of view of the end user that actually needs to use it ultimately and sort of store those files, find those documents and so on. Which interestingly, the, the thought that came to mind was about mobile signatures, right? A mm -hmm. lot of students, like especially in higher ed, you know, a lot of, most of the the students are um, not, you know, uh, they're all adults. So that they can sign their own documents. They are, you know, signing residence forms. They are signing athletic waivers. They are signing so many financial aid documents and what have you. And um, the, the students these days are very much always on their mobile devices. So making things accessible on their mobile devices, making things easy to sign where they are and whatever 
um, uh, you know, sort of system that they're using is something that we are really working um, to, to deliver for the students. And interestingly, it's a, it's a different problem in such certain situations, right, where there's connectivity issues, or maybe they don't have a computer, and, and the only device that they have is a mobile device. And so in any case, uh, mobile sort of continues to come up as a way in which a lot of our end users experience our products. And so for us, like that's one, one thing that came to mind for me. Um, and then the, the other piece that was interesting when you came up is, you know, when you're talking about, oh, the, this student said um, that they were not getting the experience they were looking for. Now we have reached a place as a, as a sort of cultural um, way in which we experience the world we expect a level of digital experience. We expect that when I log into my shopping account, it behaves in a certain way. It remembers what I last purchased from the same website and it, it saves my credit card. And you know, as a, as a consumer, we've started to come to expect those digital experiences. And I think document experiences need to be in a, in a rich sort of immersive way in the same, same idea of it. And so one of the things that we have just recently talked about is notarizing, right? Notarizing is, is usually a thing where, yeah, there used to be a time where I had to physically go over to somebody's office, sit in front of somebody, show them my like driver's license, and then they would notarize my documents. Then I started having like mobile notaries where the notary would come to my home if I needed something signed. But now with digital notarization, like no, you know, e-signing and digital no notary on, on a signature platform is sort of how I, I would say like shopping is, has evolved too. I mean, I had to go to a store to touch and feel the clothes I want to buy and now I buy them online. And similarly, it's that similar journey of digitization that's happening in the world of signatures and documents um, is sort of what I heard when I heard Rico and, and Steve talk about it. Yeah, because the technology has been here, right? I mean, it's it's been more, it's it's been here for, for several years, but it's this change in perception of it being a, a valid form of endorsement uh, that has had such a violent shift just because everyone had to do it. And I know Rico and Steve that maybe some of the most recalcitrant folks are university professors in terms of this is the way I've always done it. How could I do it any differently? Um, are you still seeing any resistance uh, there or has everybody really, all it took was a global pandemic to get uh, old professors to, uh, to, to change their ways and start to use digital signatures? Steve, I'll start with you. Well, uh, a, a little bit, but you know, that's, and, and I can see Rico smiling already. You know, part of it is how much of that shift is going to go backwards. You know, as I, as I talk to, to students and in my peers, you are starting to say, okay, are we going to start to move back to the way we were, mm. or are we going to really embrace moving forward digitally or well, the pandemic's over now, I can go back to just putting a signed copy in somebody's mailbox and expecting it to be dealt with. Right. And so I think that's the jury is probably still out on that. Mm. But I, but I do think as Chitra pointed out that just that mobile piece, and I'm amazed how many students live on their mobile device in class, right? They're using their phone to do their synchronous zoom meetings and, all of their, you know, the LMSs pretty much use that. They can pull articles up, you know, that way. And so that flexibility is a great thing. But then, you know, the artificial intelligence agent in my email will tell me that I need to take more time off because I got to stop answering email. I actually, you know, my AI robot yelled at me on Monday <laughs> um, because it told me I, I work too much on the weekends. Uh, but it's easy to do that too. And, you know, it's about being responsive. And I think, you know, the digitization is one thing that helps us be responsive to our students and our colleagues, right? So I don't have to sign it, put in an inner envelope, inner office mail envelope, wait for it to travel to a different campus, have somebody else open it, sign it. It can all be done, you know, exceptionally quickly. And so 
I think that's the other piece is it does allow us to be more responsive mm-hmm. as well. And I think that's important. And I'm hoping that that continues. But I'm kind of holding my breath because I think, you know, being the time honored, tradition bound kind of people that a lot of higher ed faculty are, I think you will see some shift backwards. It'll depend upon how well people like Shitra and Rico do of training us and making sure that we feel we can trust the documents and we can go find them when we need them later. Yeah, Yeah. it's interesting, Steve, that you're bringing up that people might sort of struggle to stay here and and there's an opportunity that they might sort of, in a way you're saying, go back, come forward. The way I see it is actually, I feel like there are certain things that are best done in person, right? Like uh, when you think of even teaching and learning, uh, and there's tons of studies that show that in-person, you know, instruction, there's really no replacement for some of that. Um, the way I think about at least the, the signature part of it, the administrative part of it is many of us and, and me included, I mean, we haven't gone back to the office in, in a long time. I've been working and I feel fully productive sitting right here, right? Um, and, and I think the way I see it is when, when we did studies, we saw that there were a lot of people who are spending their time on administrative tasks, that they would rather be spending their time preparing lesson plans, spending time with students, actually, you know, sort of in the act of actually teaching and learning and academia work in sort of administrative work. And I think the way at least I look at it is if we can quantify and and demonstrate how we are meaningfully freeing up time for those of the folks who are directly student facing, and they can focus less on these paperwork and going from building to building, as you said, and actually focus more on what they truly love and want to do, which is teaching. Um, I think that is one way to help them sort of stay in this new new world of functioning. That's one. And I think when we come to sort of more on the administrative and the IT side of things, it's the efficiency and the cost savings. It's non-trivial when, when we look at the numbers, it's, it's huge. And, and that's one, another way in which we can demonstrate um, how they can stay there. The example of academia is adding and dropping classes. I was talking to a school, a university student, and I won't name the university, but they literally hold a piece of paper and a pencil, and then they go to class to class kind of checking out whether they want to be in this class or not for a week. And then they request the professor or like some administrative office to add or drop their classes. And the whole thing takes two and a half weeks. Now, two and a half weeks in a semester or maybe in a quarter, if you think about it, that's a lot of instruction time lost trying to figure out. So if that can be done, just the paperwork of it can be done in one day. I mean, I would think that the professors would be happy that they are actually getting two weeks back to teach instead of these kids kind of transitioning in and out of their classes because they haven't figured out whether they want to take the class or not. It just feels, it, 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 and those are the kind of things that I go, oh, wow, okay, this is a great opportunity and a, a use case to demonstrate that, oh, there is actually no going back because this is, this is a bit of a no-brainer. Yeah, yeah along those lines, right? I, I always use this analogy with salespeople. Like, they're like, well, can we get this done? Well, if, if you want something pushed five feet at a university, this goes probably for all of them, five people got to push it a foot and then, then you'll get there, right? And to your point, Citra, it could take two weeks with signatures, email, what, you know, if you have an electronic document, we, we sign off five, six departments, five, six different people sign off on an employee leaving saying they don't, you know, they don't have this account, they don't have that account. We do that usually in the course of four hours, right? As soon as we get it, if everyone's there, they sign off, that person's exited out, they're out of the system and we move forward, right? But there's, to to Steve's point, organizationally, it was very, you know, everything else is very methodical. Well, you know, if you want this, you gotta have all the deans sign off on it. You gotta have this person sign off on it. And again, that could take, you know, forever. Where if a dean could just click it, you know, one night, you know, they're working a little late, they see the agreement. Oh, I love this. Let's go. We click it. He or she clicks it and we're, we're moving on. You know, and, and, at the end of the day, I think that's 
that's the kind of power that, like you said, you can recapture that time, right? Because you're not spending your time on the minutia of all this stuff that has to be done, has to be signed off on, you know? I mean, I think, sometimes I think in, at least in our university, there's someone in the Dean's department to handle all the stuff that he or she's got to sign or he yeah. or she's got to sign. I mean, they you got know- you're just, bringing up a great do. point about about um, signatures, right? So when we think of, you know, in university, you're always hiring TAs, RAs, adjunct professors, and this process happens every year in the beginning of the year. So it's not a thing like a one and done where like in a corporation, you hire a person and, you know, you sort of don't, the volume of hiring is not the same as a corporation. So much higher in the university, but to Rico's point, there is, you know, Rico has to sign and then, you know, Steve has to sign and then Kevin has to approve. And so there are actually workflow automation tools wherein it automatically will route. So I can designate as a system administrator, I can go in and say, oh, this is the process. So until Steve signs, Rico, uh, Kevin cannot sign or Steve and Rico can sign in parallel. And then once either one of them signs, like whatever those rules are, I can very easily put those rules in place and then it automatically routes to wherever it needs to go. And imagine the time saved and the money saved for the university and people on board faster. Right. That was well, one it, question I, I did have about it, but we should talk a little bit about the costs and how, um, and again, pre-pandemic versus now, I, I would guess the argument for these sort of automated processes are apparent and necessary, but there's still probably um, you know some arguments that have to be made in terms of adjusting to budget. So, if we could get some um, insights into how you have each of you have done that in your institutions in terms of uh, justifying costs in terms of making the, the sort of adjustments, Steve, maybe we'll start with you. Well, what, first, just to go back to Shitra's point about you know, routing materials. The other thing is if you build them, build that routing system right, you don't have the bottlenecks we can potentially have right now where somebody goes out on leave. So if it sits so long, then it should automatically kick to the next signer or approver because that's what happens. Somebody goes out on leave or gets injured or sick. We don't have a lot of duality in higher ed, mm. right? Because we don't have that profit motive in the same way. So stuff will just sit on somebody's desk and there's a cost in frustration there. Yeah. That way outweighs the actual cost sometimes that, you know, and I have to go back to my K-12 a little bit to talk about the cost. But when we got rid of, when we went to one-to-one -one devices, we thought we'd save a little of student printing. We, we reduced our paper bill the first year by like 45%. And, you know, as my administrative assistant was just coming to me about ordering paper a couple of days ago and paper is expensive. It's getting more expensive. And I think it's all sitting in a container ship, Rico, right now and outside LA well, Harbor yeah. is where yeah. I think it probably is for some reason. But, you know, it's not just the saving of the time to do that, right? You're saving all that administrative time, which nobody ever fills out, right? Because you, you fill the form out incorrectly in paper in sadly true story in my last position, my, uh, I over tipped an Uber driver six cents because the university only allowed me to, to tip 20% and I rounded it up to two bucks. All right. I had like a $2,000 expense request that, you know, went through 14 levels of payment, right? Had to go all the way back. So figure to save six cents, literally, they probably spent $2,000. Right. And it went through all that paper. And that's, I mean, that's just ridiculous. Yep. Right. Whereas if you have a good automated system, it would just tell me when I, you know, if that was going to do, it would just say, Hey, tip can't be more than X yeah. and could do that. And so digitizing can save a whole lot more than just the money from a reduction of paper. It's office time. And, you know, it's probably politically incorrect to say this, but in a lot of cases, if you digitize effectively, you can really reduce your office footprint. And that's particularly important now is everybody's looking at, you know, serious enrollment issues, Absolutely. right? The more you digitize, the more you can be more effective with your staff. And especially when we don't have to have somebody sitting there now, 
all the time just to answer calls or when people walk by, there's a lot of potential savings by digitizing effectively. Yeah, it's, and it, I and think it, it's more about, you know, doing more with less, right? We don't even have to think about reducing the footprint, even with the footprint that you have right now, you're all being asked to do 10 times more. So when you think about sort of the, the you know, data that we have, one of the data points that we often look at based on research is workers are like 55% more efficient uh, with the back office processes when they've deployed sign versus before deploying Adobe sign. So it's just like, if you, you're able to get more done out of a back office employee, there's so much benefit in that. And it's interesting you bring up paper because we often talk about sustainability. There's one aspect of it, which is just sheer costs, but there's also the whole notion of, you know, I'm a more sustainable organization because I'm not killing trees and cutting paper and using as much. And there's definitely, there's something there as well. And there's, you know, some data that we've uh, been doing some analysis of about, I think it's about three or $4,000 per month of organization saving um, with just some advanced sustainability efforts with Adobe Sign. So huge, huge, like very tangible numbers, which um, uh, can directly translate into the extra cost potentially, because people look at it as, oh, it's a line item in my budget that's new that didn't exist before, but where else are you gaining the savings and the efficiency and the, the breakthroughs because of which you're able to then actually justify the cost and, and get significant ROI from it? Well, and a, lot of, and a lot of it, I think, is unnoticeable, right? Because what are we talking about? We have students. Those students are at our university, our institutions, compulsory. They could go anywhere. So they're shopping, right, in essence. So to, to Steve's point, if those processes are seamless, quicker, more efficient, more nimble, you're getting better instruction, you're getting less anger from a student who can't get something done in a timely manner. So at the end of the day, you know, you're not seeing it on a balance sheet, but if you have five more students, 10 more students as a result of the efficiency in offices, it better be the registrar, whether it be whatever, you're not going to see it directly, but there are, there are you know, there are um, cost negating things that will, yeah, you may be paying more on the, you know, the technical side of it, but if you get more enrollment, you know, the balance sheets are going to come out the way they're going to come out. So I think I think that's what, what in my university, I try to use that a lot. I'm like, look, how does it impact the student, right? You know, we, we, we outlaid some money for a, a 24 hour 7365 help desk for our, our learning management system before COVID. We were ready to go before COVID, COVID hit and everyone's like, oh, we just made the greatest decision in our, of our life. Because again, kids, you know, a kid might need something at 10 o'clock at night. A student may not need some, an adult student may need a form filled. So anyway, the more and more we can make these processes more seamless and more not, you know, work hour dependent, I think that'll say, you know, someone will say, I went to Benedictine, it was great, everything is razor sharp, I had no problems with the courses, the registrar, it was an overall great experience, you know, because yeah, everyone's going to have a great classroom experience, they're going to have great teachers, that, that's all a given, but I think a lot of it becomes, you know, like the whole process, you know. It, you know, do I, do I have a problem if I want to drop a class and pick up a class? You know, do it. Can I do that efficiently? Right. Do it more efficiently. Right. Because they can't be frustrated because though they can walk away now. Right. Because we clearly have fewer students than we have places in most universities. You know, we need to be much more aggressive in how we attract them. And, you know, Rico, you make an excellent point. If they're frustrated in the application process, then they may just walk away and go somewhere else, mm -hmm. right? We need to meet them at the front door and continue to show them how to move through as seamlessly as possible. In a lot of ways, that means making things work well on their mobile device and giving them that 24 seven, you know, all you have to do is go in and D2L and take a look in any learning management system. It's horrifying when my students are posting assignments. Right. My assignments are all due at 11:59, and I'm always amazed when they're dropping them in 11:58. because <laughs> let's just be very clear at this point in my life. I'm usually asleep at 11:58, um, in a couple minutes or two earlier than that, but there is that real need for things anytime, you know, and on demand and digitally they can do that. 
right? If they want to fill out a form, they don't have to go down to an office, schlep in, wait, get a paper copy and fill it out. They can just fill it out electronically whenever the mood hits them. And that's, you know, that's an accessibility issue that we didn't have if we don't have digital, you know, digital processes. Yeah. Right. And for example, us, we have, we're in, we do business in four time zones, two of them international time zones. So middle of the night type stuff. Right. So. So I knew the toughest part of my job this afternoon was going to be to actually end this conversation, <laughs> but we do only have an hour uh, in, in the, uh, in the event. And I wanted to just kind of wrap up uh, and, and get maybe a, a crystal ball. Uh, hopefully I'll use a couple of cliches, but glass half full prediction on where you see your particular systems uh, in, in three years. I mean, uh, Rico, you were talking about you were at 50%. You know, do you see yourself at 100%? Is 75? Give us just kind of a little bit, handicap yourselves. And I know it's being recorded. I, I promise not to come back to you in three years. Uh, but just give us a little bit of a forecast of where you see yourself being and your, your institution's forms automating process in, in, say, three to five years. Rico, I'll put you on the hot seat. I'll put, I'll put it this way. I think we'll be where our student population wants it, right? I don't think we're ever going to be 100% online. We're not, you know, one of those 100% online universities. But I do think through the pandemic, we saw an uptick of students, quote, staying home, older students saying, maybe it's time for me to complete my degree or I need, you know, further, you know, and through economic downturns and and crises, we have not experienced a pandemic. I think a rise or desire for you know that type of adult continuing education, degree completion, people look for ways to diversify. So I think I, the way I look at it is I could see us going up 10, 15% just you know already because of the pandemic, but I kind of don't know if we'll ever get over that like 75% non-traditional because I, I think we still do things like in the sciences that are very important and experiential and need to be on campus. Yeah, that's yeah. fair enough. Hopefully, hopefully we'll be prepared to for what the, the desire is by the you know the consumer. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Rico. And, and Steve, how about you? I, I think that probably the same answer Rico gave. It, it, you know, it's really going to be driven by students and what student needs are. And I think that you are going to see, I think you're going to see people drag their feet about coming in back into the offices. So I think you're going to see a lot of back office tasks automated in probably at a quicker level. But when you look at undergraduate students, like 80% of the undergraduate students would still prefer a face-to-face -face learning experience. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, graduate students are the opposite, right? But I think you're gonna see, you know, we've talked about this for probably a decade now, there's still that need to change what that experience is from just the traditional three credit course. And I think you're gonna see more change, but I think when you look at the data and the documents, hopefully we're gonna get more organized, but I think you're gonna see much more data streamlining and hopefully you'll start to see a handshake effectively between our learning resources that are electronic and our administrative resources so that we just have one system truly as opposed to lots of little pieces and we're much more organized. Great, thank you. And Chitra, we'll leave the last word to you today. Yeah, uh, where do you, no. where, uh, I think um, Rico and Steve summed it up really well. I feel like there are certain things that are best left for it, them to be experiential, in person, and um, you know, there's deeper learning that happens as a result of that. But that actually gives an opportunity for some of the back office tasks, some of the administrative, you know, paperwork, some of the things that have traditionally sort of not necessarily been a, a topic of innovation or change in, in academia, there's an opportunity for those to uh, move forward and become more um, outcome oriented and um, flexible. And, and when I say flexible, I kind of think of even Steve's example of being able to submit your homework when you want to versus when the professor has office hours open, right? Um, to all the way to filling up a form and completing it and enrolling it and moving classes or get, requesting a transcript and what have you, doing it on their own time with a digital experience that is fully integrated and connected with other systems. Like that digitization journey, I think is only going to go forward and go more and more complete. 
um, while the experience of learning can still be very much experiential. Great. Well, I see that our time is just about up, so I'm going to um, wrap it up. Uh, to the audience, if you submitted a question that we didn't get to directly, someone from Adobe will follow up with you directly. Uh, I'd like to thank our presenters today for a very informative presentation. And I'd like to thank all the audience members as well for, for joining us. As a reminder, you'll get an email within the next few days that contains a link to this recording along with the slides. Thanks again for participating and have a great day. Thanks all.